Today we have the opportunity to explore the wonderful world of microelectronics. And we've got a great guide. We have Professor Eugenio Corlocello. Yeah, he's <laughs> very handsome guy. He's, he's a professor of electrical engineering here at Yale. And he's gonna tell you about some of his research in microelectronics. He's doing some really neat things. So we'll welcome him to the podium. And uh, thank you everyone as well. Well, good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? And I'm sorry about my accent. I hope you can get through that, too, <laughs> as well. Um, by the way, if you, if you don't understand anything, just stop me. Let me know if you have any question, even during the talk. Just, just ask. I'll try to answer if I know the answer. So today I wanted to tell you um, a little bit about um, uh, what the microelectronic world and also what do we do um, during every day um, as electrical engineering. Uh, a little bit of you know, the real job and also in research. And um, I think you're all um, very familiar with electronics. You know, um, I think the electronics have changed uh, the way we live life. And uh, you all know this because you all have some of these gadgets. Let me, let me do a little survey here. How many of you have a computer? Nice. Who doesn't have a computer? I'll buy you one. <laughs> Just kidding. How many, how many of you have a cell phone? Oh, mom and dad didn't buy you one yet, huh? Well, bad luck. So welcome, welcome you guys to Science Saturday. Okay, everybody found a seat? Okay, I'll proceed. So, electronics change your life, but um, many of you might not be aware of it, I think, because, you know, maybe you haven't seen how things changed. And now I start to sound like my grandfather. But I, I wanted to tell you a little bit of what I mean. Okay, so a lot of things that you, you guys use every day, like a computer or a cell phone, have only been here very few, you know, 20, 30 years, very little time. And, uh, and they really change our lives. I'll try, to, I'll try to tell you why first. And then we'll, we'll go and see how these things are made. So first of all, if we wanted to communicate between you know, one person and another person 100 years ago, we didn't have all these gadgets and toys. Um, what did we have? What did we use? Telegraph. Oh, yeah, I don't know those. <laughs> how about voice? Okay, well, yeah, Morse code too. The kids made uh, soup cans in a The store. megaphone. Yes, yes, I have a picture of those. Right there, right? <laughs> I <ain't done. laughs> So we had to use our voice, maybe a megaphone, or uh, I don't know how else it's called in English, or, or maybe one of these gadgets, one of these toys, if you want to communicate long distance, right? And uh, if you wanted to talk to a lot of people, well, you had to... You know, to group them all together someplace in a room, like in a town meeting, and, and talk to them. But you couldn't talk to more than 100 people directly, you know, 100,000 people. Then word had to be, you know, a person had to, to repeat what I was saying to other 100 people and so forth. They had to spread out like that. It was a long process. And if you wanted to communicate between one city to another city, then you had to use beacons. How, how many of you guys saw the Lord of the Ring, the movie? Right, so you remember that they were using beacons to communicate when they were getting all these people for the final battle? Right, they were using these beacons, so they would light fires, and they would say, come, help, you know. So those are the way, it was pretty rude, but that's the way uh, you used to communicate. But then, you know, just in the last 100, 100 years, basically, thanks to the electronic evol evolution or revolution, how you want to call it, then we started having gadgets like this. So on the top, 
It's uh, my grandma's phone. <laughs> no? Maybe some of you guys have seen it before. In the middle, there's a phone that, you know, when I was born. And that's what we have today. Okay, the telephone. So this is a nice toy. And today, all of us have a cell phone, you know, like this, or in, in many other incarnations, right? So this is the evolution, but, you know, this is very recent. This is just the 10, 15 years ago, okay, that everybody could buy one of these. So what can you, why, why did life change with these gadgets? You know, because before, you could only talk to a few people around you, you know, like I'm talking to you right now. Actually, you know, I'm helped by electronic devices here, too, that amplify my voice. Otherwise, some of you in the back might not hear me, unless I start talking really like, like a dinosaur. <laughs> and uh, when the phone came out, then all of a sudden you could talk to everywhere in the planet, but you couldn't really talk to a person. You had to talk to a house, because, you know, the house was hosting the phone. The, the phone was in the house. So if I, was, if, if I was looking for you, for example, I had to call your house. And if you were out playing, I couldn't find you, and vice versa. You know, you couldn't find me. But, you know, nowadays we have this. We have this gadget, the cell phone. And now I can finally talk to anywhere on the planet to, to a specific person, and I can find them wherever they are if they want to be found. Okay? Obviously, this is a, this is a good uh, revolution and evolution because it allows us to talk to people we want, but also has some problems, you know, some of which your parents are not too happy about, you know, the problem with cell phones. But I'll try to keep on the positive side here today, so I'll just tell you the good things. <laughs> also, another thing that electronics change, um, in, in, in my point of view, another reason why electronics really change our life is in the way we deal with knowledge. So how do we transfer knowledge? You know, in the old times, uh, when people would uh, pass away, uh, they had no way of, of leaving any knowledge they accumulated besides telling you know, stories, maybe with stories uh, that were passed, again, by voice. Or maybe, you know, like this is prehistoric drawing in a cave. They would transfer some knowledge about, I don't know what kind of knowledge they would transfer here. but by drawing, basically, you know. So there was an evolution there, too, in the last uh, thousands of years. But it's nothing compared to what electronics had done in the, in the last hundreds of years. So of course, there was um, the invention of paper. So finally, people didn't have to rely on voice to communicate. If I found something during my life, I didn't have to tell a story to somebody else. I could just write it. So not one person, but many people could read it. No, it could read exactly what I wanted to say. And then came the movable type during the mil Middle Ages, right? And uh, so all of a sudden, you could start writing books. Yes, you have a, you have a question? Oh, I have no clue. It's probably English or, or Latin or German. <laughs> German? <laughs> Somebody tells me German. OK, so with the movable type, you could start producing books, although you didn't really need movable type to do books. There were books even before. But with movable type, you could do many books. You can print them in series, a lot of them. Okay? So this, this was sort of the, the state of the art until 100 years ago. Right? And one thing that you have to remember is nowadays it's not so clear. So if, um, if just uh, not even 100 years ago, but 30 years ago, if I, if I wanted to find out something about knowledge, human knowledge, if I wanted to find out how many people are in Pakistan or what's the capital of Pakistan, well, then, you know, maybe if I was lucky enough to have an encyclopedia at home, and not so many people had that, and uh, I could read, you know, maybe a few lines. But if I wanted to know more about Pakistan, you know, the culture, I had to go to the town library. So I had to make a trip, you know, half an hour and so forth. It would take me some effort to do this, right? But then, you know, nowadays we have the internet. All of you, all of you have it at your disposal now. You think, oh, you know, it's always been there. It's no big deal. But it's, it is a big deal, <laughs> you know? And on the internet, you can do lots of things, like pretending to be someone else. But I'm, I'm not teaching you these tricks today. <laughs> um, this is what we see every day, right? You know, we, you wake up, many of you, uh, maybe your parents don't let you do that because it's too much browsing, you know, but 
be in my jobs, I have to see these things all, every day. And you know, all of a sudden I have the entire human knowledge, not in books, but, but over here. So I can up, just open my laptop, I can search for anything. I don't have to go to the town library, I don't have to make a special trip. By the way, the town library was just a, a small example, but if I had some crazy thing that I was studying, you know, like a culture of a special book in Pakistan, I would actually have to go to Pakistan to find this book. Nowadays, I don't even have to do that. It's most probably in there. So this is really neat. It's like a really great technology to do these things. But it gets even better. You know, nowadays with this thing, you know, because of some people, I actually have the internet in my hands. So I don't even have to go at home on my computers, but I can just look things up here. In fact, we do it all the time. You know, I'm out with my wife. I want to find out where a movie is playing. Or she asked me a question, how many people in Pakistan? I don't know why I would want to know. <laughs> And I find out, you know, because I'm a, you know, I'm a geek. I want to know this stuff. <laughs> so, and it, it, it's really nice that you can find out right away because, you know, when I was a kid, uh, like you guys, you, I couldn't find these things out. Somebody would ask a question, we would all scratch our heads and say, oh, my God, you know, and then we would forget. So nobody would learn anything, really. But now you can. So this is a big, big revolution, you know, and many of you might not be aware that it's only like 20 or 30 years old, really. Okay, but, so, first I wanted to start with some history, but, you know, you, that's not why you're here today. Today you're here because you, you wanted to know what's, what's inside my Game Boy, DS, PlayStation 3, Xbox. How many have a DS? How many a PlayStation 3? Me too. How many? Good. Uh, how many are, are we? It's fun, right? Okay, whatever you have, they're all fun, I think. They're all really great toys. But, you know, they actually use the same devices that are used in a computer, in a cell phone nowadays, to do different kind of tasks. You know, some, now they, you can play games with them, and I'll show you. So, all of these things, you know, both the internet, and now even cell phones are really computers. You know, the new cell phones that you buy, they're little tiny computer, or if you buy a new one. So all of this is because all of this revolution, most of it happened with the computer nowadays. That's the way we communicate. I talk to my mom with Skype on the computer, you know. I see her. So I, I can not only compute, find information, but also communicate, right? And this is all, all computers are made with very simple elements. They're made with a switch like a light switch. How many of you have seen a light switch or have one in their home? <laughs> All of you, right? <laughs> Who doesn't have one? <laughs> Come on, you have one. You see? <clears throat> okay, so but that's, that's a pretty big switch. But you know, then scientists started to scratch their heads and they wanted to miniaturize this and they made this thing in the middle which looks really ugly. In reality, it's really tiny. Uh, it was uh, somebody at Bell's lab in the 50s. Uh, then made that. And then, you know, in the 70s they made this, which is really tiny. It's like the, your, your pinky uh, little nail. It's as tiny as that. And now transistors in, uh, in, in the device that I'm going to show you, they're, they're so tiny that we don't see them. Like if you take one of your hair, I can put thousands of them in, inside one of your hair. Millions of them. So they became really, really tiny. Yeah, even, yeah, even your hairs, yes. So how many of you flipped the switch in your house recently, today? Okay, I think if you can do that, then you can design computers. So after, after this, we can all meet down there, we'll design a new computer together if you want. So a, a computer, I'm going to teach you, you know, if you want to learn something today, just uh, stay awake the next two minutes. That's what I wanted to teach you. A computer is made of a lot of switches, and switches are like the one that you switch to, to turn on or off a light. Okay, so very, very simple things. But it just gets a little bit more complicated. So if I put two switches, you know, one in series with the other, so I have two switches, okay? In order for me to turn on the light, I have to make this, this line here continuous. I have to, to make it 
go from this node to this node. So I have to flick switch one and I have to sw sw flick switch two, right? Both of them. If I do only one, it's not gonna turn on the light. So that's one of the logic function in a computer. That's the, the, the end function, okay? That's one of the functions. We need three functions and then we can make any computers we want. It's really simple. So one of them is this. Okay, so two switches, I have to flick both of them. If I flick only one, it doesn't work. The light doesn't turn on. Then there's a not switch, which is kind of a funny thing because the light is always on and I flick the switch when I want to turn it off. Okay, so it's like an inverted kind of thing. Like a security light that I, it's always on but I only, I only want to turn it off sometimes. That's a not, not logic function. And then there's the or logic function. And now look, look at this, you know, this, I have two parallel wires here with two switches. They're in parallel. So now if I want to turn on this light, I don't have to flick both switches. I just need to flick one, either the top one or the bottom one, and the light will turn on. That's the OR gate, either one or the other. So now with these three functions, the AND, NOT, and OR, we can make any computers, including your Game Boy, the DS, my cell phone, and so forth. Isn't it cool? Yeah. Isn't it simple enough? Yes. The touch screen? Oh, that's a difficult question. I'll, ask, I'll answer to that uh, in a few minutes, okay? How about that? So, so, okay, now you see all these little, all these little end gate, or gate, like we call them gates. They have a symbol like that. Can you recognize it? It's like a little half circle. This is the end, end gate here. This is the symbol for the knot. We give them a symbol just to remember them, like a picture, you know, it's, it's easier. Otherwise, we, we would forget. And this is a, a or, so it has this little half moon and then it's like a gothic window, you know. So can you recognize them now? And, not, or. So if I put 20 together, 20 transistors, so these things are made of switches. They have switches inside called transistors. And there's 20 of them, and I make this circuit. So, so you can find out here, you know, this is, this is the knot, right? What is this one? Great. And this? Perfect. Oh, so, oh you already know how to design computers now. You go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you in my lab to do some work. <laughs> so with 20 transistors, you can do this little circuit here, which is probably what controls your microwave oven when you want to control the temperature. Something like this, you know, something simple. Or like a Coke distributing machine. If you put 2,000 transistor, then it gets complicated, you know. So here, I'm showing a drawing, and inside here, there's all these little switches. Do you see how, how tiny they are? So this picture is magnified. In reality, this thing is like, a, you know, your, uh, your thumb nail, basically. I'm magnifying all of them. So this is Intel. Who, who knows who, who, what Intel is? Intel. They make microprocessor. They make uh, this, this, you know, the basic element of your computer, what makes everything run programs and so forth. So they were one of the first to make microprocessors. So in 71, that's the day, bef the year before I was born, they made this thing, 2000 transistor. Okay. And there's a professor here called TP Ma that lend me all these beautiful pictures for some of them. So then you go to 74, a few years later, you go to 6,000 transistor. Now you don't see them anymore, they're so tiny, they are, you know, these little switches, they become tiny, it looks all crumpled up, it's hard to see, right? And then you go to 1982, how many years ago, 1982? 70, yeah, just so it's not that long ago, right? Not that long ago. 13, 130,000 transistors. Okay, then 85, 275,000 transistors. So now we don't see them anymore at all. You know, all this, they become like crazy, crazy pictures. 
Yes, I'm sorry, I'm ignoring it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. I'm going to tell you in a second. You're asking me all these questions. Wow. <laughs> so they, they actually make, I'm going to show you in a couple of slides. I have, I have it here because I, I knew that you were going to ask me this. <laughs> and then, you know, in 89, uh, one million. How, how many is one million? It's a lot of. How many people in New Haven? 134,000. Oh, you're good. <laughs> and uh, which city has a million people here in? No, New York. Hi. Uh, uh, Harvard has 374,000. Bridgeport has 184,000. Stanford has 110. Maybe the whole Connecticut. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe the whole Connecticut. Maybe I should look it up on the web. But <laughs> so there's more transistor here switches than people in New Haven or in the, in the area around here. So a lot of, a lot of little switches. Okay? Not the big one, the tiny one. Then we go to 93, we go to 3 million transistor. 97, how many years ago 97? 12. 12. 7 million transistors. 99, 28 million. Okay, you got the idea, 2,000, 42 million. This is now. Now, that's pretty much, that's what I have in my computer here, the one that is projecting things for you, 410 million. That's more than the people that are in the United States, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, a lot of these little switches, don't see them anymore here. But it gets better, you know. Last year, there, there were some, some, some new chips and that have two billion transistors. That's like a, a third of the world's population. You know, a lot of them, lot, lot and lot and lot. This is actually many things together. So how did they put all these things together in here? You know, how is it possible? You know, some, some of you ask me, how do I put all these switches in such a tiny space? Yes, you're... The last picture, yeah. These are all, you know, like uh, basically your uh, um, your thumb nail. That's the size. I cannot hear you very well. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you're correct, exactly. So in order to fit them, because all of these pictures that I showed you are about the size of my nail, so in order to put more transistor, they had to make it smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so all, all these engineers uh, before me, smarter than me, they, they did this. You know, they put all these transistors, they made them smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, and, that, and that's like 30 years of work, because the first one was in 71, right? So how do we do this? Actually, it's very simple. You know, how many of you can draw on a piece of paper? More, more. Come on, all of you can draw. I don't see enough signs up. I didn't say beautiful drawing, just any drawing. And now, how many of you drew something with a computer? Good, good. So if you draw something with a computer, you can really help me to make a, a microprocessor or a computer later. It's because all we do is we, we draw. We draw shapes like this. So this is, you know, this shape here is a knot. One of these gates that I showed you, the end, the knot, or, or not. We draw them like this. And then we, somebody with a big factory that costs millions and millions of dollars, they make them really tiny. They have sophisticated machines that make them really tiny. And the way they do this is they you know, when you go to a movie theater, they pro like, like now, there's a projector that projects things big. Instead of projecting things big, this machine projects really small. So they make, you know, my transistor really, really tiny, like a few nanometers, like a million times smaller than your hair. So that's how these things are made. And this is the program, this is the drawing program 
that we use in my lab upstairs. So maybe not me, but a lot of my students, they spend days drawing here. You see, these are, these are very simple drawings, just squares, really. No? They're not that complicated. So if you can draw this thing, you draw a gate. If you draw 20 of these, you made the first circuit. And if you replicate these 20 100 times, then you get to 1,000. You make a microprocessor. That's how we make them. It's not so complicated, really. This is, this is for example, a bigger drawing that, you know, that I made a few years ago. This is uh, an amplifier, the one that amplifies my voice here. So you can see how we drew every little thing with a computer, just drawing rectangles. Okay, well, you know, I told you all this boring stuff, but <laughs> you really came here to see what's in your Game Boy and the DS. But actually, that's what's in your Game Boy in your DS on your PS PS3. There's all these chips, all these tiny little things. So I took a picture here from the web of a Nintendo DS. Okay, actually, it's a Game Boy Advance or a Nintendo DS. So here you see, if you open up that beautiful case, you see all these components, right? If I open up this case here. And this black thing, the biggest component, that's the microprocessor. So that's basically one of these, okay? One of these is inside here. This guy, this black thing. And it's, it's again, you know, slightly bigger than my fingernail. This is the Xbox. How many of you have an Xbox? Good, good job. So, you know, this, uh, this is the microprocessor. It's here. You see? It's tiny. This is just a package. It has a lot of pins here. It has a thousand, a thousand of connections. But uh, the circuit inside is, is smaller. It's, like, it's really like my fingernail. It's inside here. That's what's in there. And this is the PlayStation 3. Who has a PlayStation 3? I have one too. I play with my wife sometimes. It's fun. <laughs> so this is this one here is the cell cell processor. So it's a processor that in, inside has nine processors. So it's like nine computers. Why? Because it has to do lots of beautiful graphics. But that's what's inside. Nothing else. So if you can build this you can build the entire thing. So here is the, the processor that is inside, you know, if you have, who has a, at home, a, not a laptop, but a big computer with a big case? Okay, yeah, so if you, if you get a graphic card to play video games with that computer, you buy a GeForce, this is the, the die. You have a question? Yeah. Oh, this is, you know, old stuff. What I could find. I found these pictures on the web, you know. And this is, oh, this is the chip of the Xbox, the new one. This is the microchip. So he has actually three, three microprocessors inside, one, two, and three. And this is the cell processor, the one in the PlayStation 3. You see that there's one, two, three, four, eight, eight little thingy here. There are pieces repeated. There are eight microprocessors repeated to do more beautiful graphics. Okay? In fact, when I was a kid, you know, maybe younger than you, I, had, I was playing with a Commodore 64, which was one of the small computer, and uh, we had games like this. You know, the chicken wire, wireframe games, the vector games, and I really loved them because, you know, all of this even though they were really ugly. You know, they're really ugly, but I love them because they were made of vectors and the computer was calculating the image by computing it at every instance. So every time I would move, it would compute the new perspective. And I thought it was really cool. So I told a friend of mine that really loved soccer. And he was playing soccer, you know, with these things that you, you know, these games that you look from the top and you have these sprite, these graphics moving around. It's like an old style. And I told him, he was making fun of me because I was playing this game. He said, ah, you're playing this ugly chicken wire game. You know, what is that? I said, you know, one day they will make 
um, your soccer with the chicken wires. <laughs> it, will look, it will look beautiful. He didn't believe me, and I got lucky in my prediction because that's what happened. So nowadays we have this, you know, PlayStation 3 can do this kind of stuff. And it's just a big, fat microprocessor with many units that can do a lot of number crunching. And they compute every one of these is like a little polygon, a little triangle that it's, you know, has a different color. And there's so many of them. There's millions and millions. It looks real. And when they move in real time, the computer calculates exactly how these things move and changes and all the perspective, all the shadow. It's a lot of calculations. You know, it's a lot of difficult problem. But, I mean, it looks beautiful, right? Who doesn't like it? <laughs> Why? No, come on. Okay. Parents don't like video games, right? <laughs> and it's, you know, it's true. You shouldn't waste all your day playing video games. But some, some video games is good. You know, they make you faster. They make you think faster. React. I think some video game, you know, like half an hour a day is good. <laughs> okay, now I got in trouble. <laughs> I'm going to run away from the back door here. <laughs> okay, last thing I want to tell you, you know, then, uh, then you can go home and you, because you're bored with me. Is what, what we do here in, uh, at Yale, in my lab and other colleagues' lab is we use this microchip to do other things, not just computers, but we use them, for example, in medicine. You know, there are microchips, not, not specifically us, but these are other examples, you know, microchips that can uh, make you hear better if you have a hearing loss, like you know, my grandfather or somebody that had a problem. Or there's pacemaker if your heart is not able to pump regularly, and so forth. Yes, you have, an, you have another question? Scream. Okay. You can ask me soon. And in our lab, we do similar, similar chips. You know, here, for example, is uh, one example here in, 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 uh, is we make a microchip that studies the brain. So it looks at how the brain is responding to stimuli, for example, in animals. So we make a really tiny chip miniaturized, it's, you know, small, again, it's much smaller than my finger. Then we make other microchips to study cells, to, you know, to be able to, to develop new drugs that are more safe to the consumer. Also, chips are used in robotics, you know, because one, one big thing, one big market of microchips is computers. But actually, you know, we really would like to have robots doing, you know, washing dishes, right? Yeah. Right? Or driving our car. Now, what else? Laundry. Laundry, yes. No, all these ugly tasks. Yes, I have another question. The vacuum? Vacuum cleaner. Yeah, yeah, there is one. The vacuum cleaner, Roomba, there is a little robot. But that, you know, so that, even that robot there, so that's what we have at home, the Roomba. It cleans. It's like a little vacuum cleaner. That's the state of the art. Well, it's actually pretty bad. Because it doesn't do anything. It's just bumping around uh, randomly, really picking up things. I would actually like my robot to do more interesting things. You know, like go fetch my keys, find that where I left my wallet, you know, things like this. <laughs> but they can't do that, you know. And uh, so, so in, my, in my lab, we, they can't do that mostly because they, robots cannot see very well. They don't have a very good vision. So in, in my lab, we try to make artificial eyes for robots. I call them the Terminator eye, <laughs> which you know allow robots to to see and find out. For example, you know a robot has a problem. If I tell him go fetch my keys, he cannot find it. And we can find it right like that. You know, if I see him, unless you know somebody hidden under the the table or something. But the robots, even if it's like in plain view, it cannot see it many times. Yes. Oh, finding my keys? No. <laughs> but I'm trying really hard. <laughs> no, actually, I had some success. But I didn't try with the keys, with other objects. Yeah, we can, we can do some of this stuff. But, you know, we, we're getting there. And um, so this is a movie of one of the sensors that we made recently, for example. You know, so I'll try to fast forward it a bit. This sensor 
can see different different ways that you see. You usually see something rotating like this. This sensor instead only sees a different image, just the contour and only things that move. Because these are the important information in an image that then a robot can process to find objects. So that's what we do in the lab, more or less. Oy. Okay. And then we have applications, you know, we do software that is able to find objects. For example, this was made on, a, on an iPhone. And here, for example, you show a pin and it's supposed to tell you that this is a pin. So it, it tells you, for example, the first object is a pin. Sometimes it messes up, it's not right. And we try to do algorithm that sort of mimic the way vision works for us. Okay, so th those are things that we're doing in the lab and I invite all of you to visit it next time you're around. And that's it, I wanted to conclude. Maybe I'll show you a couple of things before, before we go. I put up a page with all the people that I worked here in the last five, six years. And most of the stuff that you see that is done in my lab has been done by a few people. In the meantime, I wanted to show you just briefly before you go a couple of these things. So this one here is, uh, if you can see it, is a wafer. Okay, so it's a very thin slice where all these microchips are made. Okay, it's a thin slice of glass. And all the microchips are basically, all the little wires and little transistors are drawn in here. So this is one of them, which is really nice because it shows you really what's inside. So you see all these big squares? It's a, it's a little bit hard to see, but you see that there's like, there's a pattern, there's a little square replicated. And you can come here and I'll show you. So those are the microprocessors, okay? Then people take this. This is what goes in the fabrication. Then people take this, they cut it, and then they put it in a package like this. So this one, this one is the microprocessor right here with a lot of pins. See the number of pins in here, then you can come and see them over here. So these are microprocessor. This is a programmable board that we use in the lab to design this one here to design microprocessor here as well. And this is one of our chips, the one that we build ourselves. It's inside here, this little tiny black thing. Okay, that's one, that's one of the Terminator eyes prototype. Maybe the model, mo, mo, model 50. We're not up to the 800 that is in the movies. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's what I wanted to tell you today and thank you for coming and uh,